Hi, all. I'm Jason Prado. I joined this paper team about a year and a half ago. And unlike a lot of developers in the iOS community and on the paper team and probably here tonight, uh, I don't come from a UI programming or an Apple or an iOS background. Um, I actually spent more, a lot more time working on servers and scalable backends. Um, and I hadn't really done that much UI code before I joined paper. Um, so before working on paper, I'd, had, I'd heard a lot of myths about how UI code works. And it kind of basically scared me away. Um, <clears throat> I'd heard that UIs are messy problems that aren't, prone, aren't given to clear descriptions because the, the problems themselves are messy. Um, I'd heard that UI code has too much state and too many dependencies, so it's not really possible to test or it's not worth testing. I'd also heard that UI code has to change so quickly that it's just not worth refactoring and not worth making high quality. Um, I think we, we on the paper team have found that to be those myths to be just myths. Um, if you think about code being messy, all code is inherently messy, and the whole job of, of software engineer is to manage the complexity of a software project and, and keep complexity down. Um, as for testing, anything is, is possible to unit test if it's componentized and broken down into like, uh, systems with clear dependencies correctly. Um, and if UI requirements have to change all the time, then a system that is well factored and tested is going to actually be faster and safer to change. Um, so on the paper team, set out to build a very high quality code base. Um, and I'm not going to talk about any secret sauce or radical inventions here. Really, this is just straightforward applications of software engineering principles that we all know. Um, and I'll talk about three of those principles here today. Um, we strictly adhere to MVC. I'll go into that. Um, we favor composition over inheritance for our object system whenever possible. Um, and we separate the calculation of side effects from the application of side effects. And I'll go into each of these. Um, so this, here's a high-level view of our MVC schema. Um, we have a lot of controller objects. Uh, just for one story card, we might have several controllers. Um, so one story controller will manage a face file controller, an attachment controller for every photo or link involved, and a, even a feedback controller for the buttons along the bottom. As soon as any piece of functionality becomes too complex to fit in a view, we break it out into its own controller. Or if it's too complex in another controller, we break it out into another one. Um, of all the controllers here, only the top one is actually a UI view controller. Um, UI view controller has a very large API. Um, it has a you know, big API surface that has evolved since iPhone 1.0, and we don't actually need most of it. Um, so we, we trimmed it down. Each controller is completely trimmed down to just the API it needs to offer to its clients. There's whatever it needs to manufacture a view and then configure that view. Um, UI view controller also doesn't really fit with our, um, with our render, uh, asynchronous rendering abstractions that Scott will talk about later. Um, so uh, keep that in mind. You know, your controllers could probably just be NS objects. Uh, and when we say MVC, uh, what we really mean is model view controller, view model store. Um, so we, this, we picked up this rule that we decided to stick to, where um, views could never depend on models directly. They could only depend on these things called, that we call view models, which are immutable representations of, a, of the data a view needs to show. <clears throat> uh, so we do this to encourage the reuse of components. Um, so here's an example of that working out pretty well. Um, here on the left, you see uh, a story card representing a photo uploaded to Facebook. Um, and on the right, you see a link to an Instagram story. Um, so these are actually backed by different models in the server and in our database. On the left, we have a proper photo model. On the right, we have just a link preview model that's much more trimmed down. Um, but our designers decided that we wanted to treat both of these kinds of photos the same, uh, allow them both to be picked up and you know, interact with our gesture system. Um, so we built this photo view. Uh, that had a hard dependency on the photo model. Uh, so we couldn't immediately use it for a link preview. So we re refactored this view to depend only on an immutable view model called a photo view model. Um, and then we uh, uh, use controllers to manufacture, to, to turn these uh, models into view models that can be used uh, by the photo view. So here's a demonstration of that, or a uh, flow chart of how that goes. Um, and this refactoring went really well. Um, it caused us to decide to build all of our views in this way, uh, where a view could never then depend on a model. Um, and this rule paid off over and over again. So we did the same thing with uh, videos and video links. Uh, and then in our interactive composer, uh, we don't actually have models from the server or models in our database while a, while a story is being composed. So, but we do have the ability to create immutable view models on the fly, because they're just NS objects. Um, so that's very important there. Um, speaking of our composer, um, so the next principle is choosing composition over inheritance. So paper can render dozens of story types. There's you know, text stories, attachment stories with links and photos, uh, full screen photo stories, check-ins, shared posts, uh, 
videos, and lots of combinations among these. <clears throat> so it might seem reasonable at first to model these kinds of stories with an inheritance hierarchy. You know, like maybe a text story view is the parent of an attachment story view, which is the parent of a full screen attachment story view. This is actually not an option because of our composer. Um, so we set out to build a fully WYSIWYG composer where a single story card can transform from any kind of story to any other kind of story uh, on the fly. Uh, this actually constrains us to have just one kind of story view and make it configurable over time. Um, so instead of having a hierarchy of objects there, we actually just configure a story view um, with these objects instead. A story view is, is defined by the co its contents, which is a view model, um, metrics, which is a structure describing its, uh, its appearance, and a layout spec, which I'll go into in a moment. Uh, so this is a metric structure. A metric structure holds the configuration for a story's appearance at a very high level. Um, so this is where we put configuration for like uh, padding, font metrics, uh, kind of like directives on how things will be laid out in the future. Um, and they actually do allow for inheritance. So here you see our attachment story is like a long text story, except it has an attachment position. Um, and these are written in C++ uh, because we thought the syntax was nicer. Uh, it's, there's not a lot of infrastructure, a lot of cruft here, but it does let us inherit uh, different metrics from each other. Um, and also, since it's in C++, we can access these structures in tight loops uh, where performance matters, but really it's just the syntax that we like better. Um, and then next up we have the layout spec. So layout spec is just an NS object that answers queries for frames. Uh, it has very few dependencies, and the dependencies are very simple. Um, yeah, the inputs are just sizes and metrics and maybe some light configuration, uh, but then it comes back with frames from there. Um, so we've separated out anything that would normally go in a large bloated layout subviews method into its own class. Um, so this class has, like, has fewer dependencies, has kind of a, it's isolated, so you only have to think about layout while you're working on it, and you don't have to think about layout at all when you're not working on it. It also means layout specs uh, are totally standalone and don't depend on anything from UIKit, so I can instantiate one in a unit test and, uh, and verify that's correct. Um, which leads into the last principle I want to talk about, which is the separation of calculating a side effect from applying a side effect. And layout specs are the core of this pattern. Uh, so as you saw when the composer transitioned from one kind of story to another, uh, what, we do, what we do is calculate the destination layout spec. It's just the, where everything is going to go on the screen and, and some formatting around it. Um, and we calculate that in isolation of where the story is now. We only have to worry about where it's going, not where it, it's, where it is or how it gets there. Um, and then once that layout spec is calculated, um, we have all the final frames, and we just call this applicator function, um, optionally animated, and it creates animations for us, and everything is kind of handled transparently. Um, so you only ever have to think about one state. It's represented by this nice layout spec, and everything else is kind of handled automatically. Um, so what else could we do with the layout spec? Um, we can swap them out easily. Because they're just objects, they're just configuring an object, we could, don't have to, like, change the code and layout subviews, we just change the version of the layout spec we're using out from underneath it. Um, so Paper has this feature you might have seen where uh, we have custom link previews for lots of publishers. So we have uh, 50 different publishers now that have specialized rendering for their link previews, and we're adding more all the time. Um, so link previews, these, these views were previously configured with a layout spec um, that was handwritten uh, in Objective-C. So, but we could, since, they were, since it was so decoupled, we could actually swap this out uh, with a different kind of layout spec. So we came out with one that was, that's configured by a JSON configuration file. And you can see on the left here kind of what those configuration files look like. I sat down with our awesome graphic designer and she explained how she designs these covers. Um, she explained that uh, all the elements are laid out either in terms of a grid system that she's come up with or relative to each other. So you can actually see this in the code. Uh, like the, um, every element is, is specified either to lie on a grid or near a grid or in grid units or to lay out relatively uh, next to other elements. Um, and our designers uh, hadn't really written code before, but now she writes this JSON layout code um, completely on her own and checks it in without uh, any involvement from engineers. Another interesting thing about this methodology is that uh, this layout spec was written test first. So I wrote a bunch of tests uh, to make sure that once that given this kind of configuration file, elements lay, would lay out correctly. Um, I made all the tests pass, and then I started at iOS Simulator and, and made sure it actually looked right on screen. And it basically looked right on screen. Um, so not only is this pure UI code that you wouldn't normally think about unit testing, but it, it was written test first. Um, and it's, it's definitely found regressions uh, that would have shipped if we hadn't had these tests. 
Um, and that really wraps it up for me. Um, in conclusion, UI code is actually not impossible to make clean and, and reusable. Um, it just takes a commitment to sound software engineering practices. Uh, and next up is Keeman, who will be talking about animation. Thank you.